Hello, this is Marcin Przybłowicz, music director at CD Projekt Red. And I'm Piti Adamczyk, senior composer at CD Projekt Red. And this is Immersing with Music, approaches to musical storytelling in Cyberpunk 2077. We have to do this one virtually, but hopefully next year we're gonna hang out with you guys. Now let's jump into our presentation. So, first of all, spoiler alert. And now without further ado, let's jump right into it. So as we speak to a group of audio professionals and game developers, you are all probably familiar with the term immersion. For those who are not, immersion, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, is the fact of being completely lost in something. Now, you know, why would we even want to have that? In our book, immersion is engagement, and engagement is fun. It makes combat more exciting if the player cares about the character. It makes story more intriguing if the choices and consequences that the player makes resemble some sort of reality. And it makes exploration more intriguing if the player's curiosity is fed back by the design of the world. And this concept is not a new concept. It has been known since Aristotle through Shakespeare and into Tolkien that in order to truly appreciate a work of art, you have to either suspense this belief or cr create secondary belief into, in the present, presented reality. Now, how we try to immerse players in Night City. In Cyberpunk, we were dealing with four different types of music. We had original score, we had source cues and diegetic music, we had radio tracks and media music. Now we would like to talk about, about each of those groups, how they all fit together, and what challenges and possibilities they presented. I give the floor to Martin. So first of all, how Cyberpunk sounds? The most important question we had to ask ourselves. There are already several examples of what people have been considering as cyberpunk sound for years in movies, video games, and music in general. We knew we wanted to find our own recipe, to have our own take on how cyberpunk music can sound. Also, the IP itself pushed us to explore new territories. Our game is an adaptation of pen and paper Cyberpunk 2020, after all, and it draws heavily from world Mike Pondsmith has created. Night City is a fast, overstimulated, and dangerous place. Also, the story. It's not, some, it's not a one-dimensional journey focusing only for, on metaphysical elements, or any other for that matter. It touches on several tropes of the genre, so it's obvious music needs to answer that call and fit the world narrative arc, character development, and so on. Okay, so what to do? Our way out was pretty simple. Let's ditch, ditch the 80s and go with 90s instead. For us, that 80s sound people are so familiar with didn't have what it takes to illustrate brutality and intransigence of Night City. 90s, on the other hand, that's a completely different story from our own perspective. We grew up listening to Nine Inch Nails, Race Against the Machine, The Prodigy, Beastie Boys, and so on. Bands representing different musical styles, but having that attitude in common. Okay, custom scoring and implementation of Quest music. That was a huge part of our approach to scoring Cyberpunk 2077. You know, since Witcher 3 were aware that system-driven music or generative music is not really our forte. Witcher 3 was notorious for having the music on all the time, and this time we wanted to try a different approach and maybe introduce silence into the mix. Also, there's a lot of attention given to story and cinematic storytelling at CDPR. So we wanted our score to feel bespoke, to score the many different possibilities, many different playthroughs of each quest, and we wanted to feel that our score supports V throughout her journey. Also, minimal amount of typical cutscenes was a design feature that at first we didn't feel like we have to change our approach that much. But once you give the control of the camera to the player, and for example, you can't see the protagonist's face, a lot of things change. Especially mood-wise and pacing-wise, music had to support scenes even more. 
So the conclusion for us was simple. We have to spot and score every main quest and every side quest with custom assets. And that was a huge undertaking for a game the size of Cyberpunk, but you know, having two in-house composers capable of producing assets and implementing them, and having Paul Leonard Morgan as our outsourced composer, it felt doable. And in exchange, we got a lot of control over the playback of the cues. And our, our unwritten motto became, if a player hears a piece of music in the game, it was hand placed there for a reason. And whether it's score or cutscene, or whether it's score or source cues or diegetic music or radio tracks, whatever, we wanted to make sure that the cue that's audible for the player is the one that we intended it to be. But we started the gargantuan task by spotting the whole game. And here you can see a bird's eye view on our spotting document. Uh, we would get videos from QAs, and based on those videos, we, were, we would prepare the first set of assets. Then we would implement them, play test them, and if we maybe missed something or the design changed, we would then reiterate on those assets. And the list you saw, it could be more detailed, but each of the line actually represents like a whole family of cues rather than just one piece of music. And to further illustrate how we divided those scenes, I would like to play you two examples. This one is the, is the scene where the relationship between Johnny Silverhand and Vig is established. This is sort of their first of many quarrels. And I would like to play you this one to show you our approach to narrative scenes. Need a smoke. Where'd you stash yours? So the scene starts with a fairly soft, moody, dark drone, and it's played on a loop. Where did you even come from? How are we even talking? How the fuck should now I? Now we introduce a one-shot cue. The fuck kind of droid toy are you supposed to be? That's playing Johnny Silverhand's theme in a very transgressive, weird way. Who you work for? Start talking. Fuck. And because of the design of the Fuck. scene, this cue has a very long tail. And Fuck when we cut Jim. to black, we actually play one more cue on top of the already myself. playing one no, on a different step. The reason behind it is we wanted to time the end of this cue with the cut to black. I'll take control. I'll find a way. You hear now me? we play another cue, which is again a fairly soft drone, just to kind of keep the tension up. But also try to sell the idea that the scene is over, but it's actually not. Here we start another loop. See you never, asshole. Now like that. Stick some iron in And your that loop will play till the, the end of the scene. I can feel it. Our minds touch on you. I'm like mold on fruit creeping into you. Nothing I can do about it. You hear me? I'd puke if I fucking could. It's just a copy of the engram. I'm out there somewhere. Gotta be. Another scene I would like to play you is from one of the Nomad quests. And here V is becoming one of the Alicaldos. And similar ap approach was taken. We divided the scenes into many different segments. And wh whenever the player is in control of the action, we basically loop the piece of music. And when there is a more scripted segment, the approach is more free. Going somewhere? 
All right, v. So the first cue starts matter. We when V gets here. on the truck. Oh, you. And it's a great deck. But in spite of that, and the music that is playing a is a version of Pan Am's theme. What might as well be another world. So it's about time we fix that. You're gonna be an Aldecaldo. Which means this family will go to hell and back. Now this cue is actually a one-shot cue. Kid. Do your work. And if you take your time one of us answering now, soul, You're an Aldecaldo, it will actually it. fade to silence. Great to have you with us, which me. may seem weird, but it actually Adds a pretty cool tension to the scene. Welcome to the family. But now we reintroduce Pan Am's theme here. That's what they say. Easier to gain a Cobra's trust than an Aldecaldo's. So I know how much this means. Do you, to me, And now we play a segment well, not that's also like loop. Know. And oh, actually, Larry. this segment comes of one of the You've tracks of that a Nomad for guitar for player was playing in you some other quest. You as Bobby tells it, and I won't even mention Pan Am. Go to hell. Saul's right, though. I mean, let's face it, V. My life was in a million pieces. You broke it into a million more. But sometimes it's only then that you can piece it together again. Now, the sound effects here all right, fam, are actually done Today by our sound department, and they, and they are sort of underscoring the fact that the is, 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 is developing. It's, you know, it's almost like V is dying. And ruined all the fun. So when she gets are you all right? down from the truck, yeah. we introduce a subtle drone to also support the fact that you know her disease is developing. Not too tight. Miss this, and here once you know? again we reintroduce Pan Am's theme. I this time in a very subtle way to help support the dialogue and help this scene and this in fragment of the scene. Oh, sell the idea that proud. Pan Am and V are now very close friends. Feels like I'm part of something important. So you are where you need to be. Themes were the glue we used to illustrate narrative arc. Our goal was to take the advantage of the first-person perspective and find the way it immerses players into the storyline. Even in the early stages of development, the game, even with no music whatsoever, felt already very cinematic. After a few months of experiments, we've ended up with a number of themes, short, flexible motifs that can be easily adapted to narrative arc and serve their purpose in a number of ways. Also, their short duration nicely corresponded with the genre choices we've made regarding overall musical direction. We've ended up with two main themes and few secondary themes. V and Johnny's themes, our main motifs, and several secondary themes, illustrating Arasaka, obviously, but also transgression theme, which is a big part of the storyline, death, and a number of smaller, smaller themes or riffs or patterns tied to specific locations, gangs, and so on. I'd like to present now an example of how we've been using our themes throughout the whole game. We're gonna listen to V's theme and a few of its variations from various parts of the storyline. That's the main menu cue, first thing players hear when they launch the game. So the music doesn't waste much time and within two and a half minutes of duration, uh, the music presents the general vibe, emotional palette and some punch in B part we are listening to right now. This cue plays when Johnny manifests his presence for the first time. B. It's important you get all this. You'll fix me up, right, Vic? If I could, I would, V. Believe me. But this is... It's way beyond what I know how to do. You're the best of the best, Vic. Why can't you help me? You want the long story or the short? 
This one plays during tapeworm quest, which is stretched over the length of several other quests. Shit. If it's a two-way street, I'll somehow have to live with the fact that I let Deshaun best me. Fuck me over. Can you just tell me what you want? What you really want? Help me settle my score against Arasaka. That's it. Not having control. You can't stand it. Seeing some things are out of your hands. Don't be ridiculous, V. Cyberspace. Near end of the game. Where the player has to decide who's gonna take control over V's body. V or Johnny. On V's behalf. Thanks. As for me... I'm sorry. And finally, one of the endings. Back to you, PT. Open world music using a wider brush. So we scored all quests, all side quests, and we were ready to congratulate each other and high five because we delivered all quests way before the deadline. And then we got feedback from one of our designers who spent most of their time in the open world asking us why there's no music in the game. Well, it turned out we were so focused on scoring quests and V's story that we kind of underestimated the amount of gameplay we need to cover with our score. We initially thought that street noise, that, you know, media music and radio tracks will create enough of audio distraction that exploration music would be superfluous. Also, one more comment that we got was Combat felt underwhelming. Compared to scripted quest events, not having music in combat encounters in the open world kind of feels lame. And we tried a few different things, like placing radio amateurs with source music next to possible combat encounters, but it all just didn't feel right. So, our solution to that was produce even more assets. And we, you know, we had to be smart about it. We didn't have the time to basically write everything from scratch. And that would be impossible, that, would be, that wouldn't be practical. But we also didn't want open world content to feel less polished than quest events or, or side quests. So we once again went back to our spotting document and we diligently went through all minor quests and all street stories and we identified their needs. For more narrative moments or dialogues, we music edited already existing cues, especially the ones that didn't have one of the already established themes. And here, once again, you can check the, the bird's eye view on our spotting document. This is all the minor quests and this is all the street stories. So, for each of the in-game factions, we had to pr produce a specific combat music group. We called them combos. And every single faction got one, com one combo. Some of them were already produced for quests or side quests, but the ones like Valentino's or Sixth Street had to be written from scratch. Each set consisted of stealth, alerted and combat state. It was mostly driven by AI, but it was also frequently triggered from quest. For example, when a combat started, when an, when an alarm goes off, 
it would be weird to start with stealth, so we would start with alerted then. And we tried adding more states to combat, but again, it kind of got in the way of the groove and just didn't seem right. And as you can see, we kind of prefer horizontal inter interactivity over vertical one. There's various reasons for that, but I think the main one is the type of music we we're producing doesn't really work well with vertical interactivity because what you would really want to have is a track that's compressed, that's well produced and put together because then you really get the kind of energy we were looking for. Now I'd like to play you an example of the combo for Valentino's. So we start with combat. We go to stealth for a brief moment. This is what alerted sounded like. Back to combat. And out. So we had combat encounters covered, but there was still a question of what we're gonna do with exploration ambiences. So again, we had to be smart about it and cover a lot of gameplay. So the technique we used, we decided to take stems from already existing cues, record, record them back to cassette tapes at half speed, and then play them back through a four track cassette recorder with de delay and reverb, tweaking some EQs and playing even more with the very speed control, and recorded them as stereo tracks and into the DAW, and did very little post-processing after that. And that, you know, that technique felt right for the world. It also felt right for the fact that we were trying to evoke the 90s as much as possible, so that tape hiss added an extra level of 90s into the project. And also, thanks to that technique, we were able to produce a lot of assets, over one hour of assets in, in one day. So it, it was a great technique. And also, those ambiences weren't that interactive. They were basically just kind of playing in the background. So it all seemed to work. And I would like to play you an example of what it sounded like. And the way all those types of music fitted together is we had a fairly simple yet powerful bussing system created and the Quest music was the most important music. So it would basically block any other music that was trying to play. Then the next level of importance was combat music, which would mute car radio or radio that was pumped through speakers on the level and in those two, car radio was more important for us, so it would mute all the radio amateurs. And the ambiences were the, the, the very bottom 
of this, uh, of this chart right here. And it was basically played only outdoors and only if there was no other music playing around the player. So all those things combined, this exploration ambiences, the reuse and music editing of existing cues and combat music design was a compromise between our handcrafted approach and a more systemic one. So source music or diegetic music played an important role in cyberpunk. It was not, not only treated as some kind of audio fluff, uh, but we tried to use it narratively. And what it gave us is that it broadened our stylistic net or emotional net. And also one more thing, that it created an interesting musical fourth wall breaker, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. So this scene is a, few is a pretty important scene. This happens yeah, right after Jackie dies in the it's prologue. You're here. And you're trying to honor to him during an ofrenda. And we could have scored this scene maybe with, you know, V's theme <laughs> or a cue that we used when Jackie actually died. But we decided to go with source cue and basically score this scene with that score cue. And I it's thank just you all basically for me playing today. the guitar. And you could see I'm that going to tell you it, what kind it of makes the scene special. Was. It's not, or you know, you yet another scene this. when you have some synth drone playing around. I'll tell you it story. actually, you know, creates an interesting lore building about, because we, we don't I really say what this old. track is. You know, maybe this Jackie track is a is Jackie's favorite tune. They were at war so with there's a, actually day. also a bit of, Get you know, exploring to be done on the player's side here. They tell me he got shot. Okay, on occasion, source music was actually played in 2D from the same sort of virtual emitter that the score is played through. And once again, it added variety. It prevented us from using the same cues too many times. And most importantly, in this particular moment, it's actually cued by one of our made-up bands, Tainted Overlord, so it kind of fits well with the Nomad vibe and with the overall lore of the world. And this cue happens right after you rescue Soul in one of the side quests. So we found that breaking the musical fourth wall added variety and extra level of immersion, and, but it worked intriguingly well when those both worlds, the diegetic and non-diegetic, were actually played together at the same time. This is an example of how we did that in one of the early, que early quests in the prologue. If you choose to take the corpo path, you end up in Lizzie's bar. And once you get into Lizzie's bar, there's a source key playing, which is actually created by Gazelle Twin for us. And once the Arasaka guys come to the we introduce a drone that right? that's played as part of the score while we keep the Gazelle Twin track Beach. playing in the background. Hey, is there a problem? Are you here about Frankfurt? We're here for you. Jenkins now there's a subtle today. but audible filter on us. the source queue. No, don't believe And we're I all in score now. That's between me and Jenkins. <laughs> and as the scene okay, ends, Haley. we actually go back to a different source queue. And here's an example also from the prologue when you're infiltrating a scavenger's base. And here we have the scavenger combo. And on top of that, we have with the same tempo, same key signature playing, a, you know, a variation of the scavenger's theme in a very hardcore rave sort of vibe. But the biggest fourth wall breaker was this guy right here, Johnny Silverhand. We wanted to introduce Johnny's theme, and first of all, we wanted Johnny to have a theme because he was such a prominent character. And we also wanted to introduce that theme as one of the Samurai songs. But we didn't want this to be introduced in Chipping In or Never Fade Away. No, we wanted it to be like a cool B-side, you know? So we had to create a theme or a motif that was simple, 
that could work in many different contexts and mostly because it had to work both as a samurai song and also as part of our score. And the added difficulty was that at the time of writing, you know, the story was actually still in development. Although we knew who Johnny Silverhand is and we knew, you know, how the story will go, the specifics that would be required to create a bespoke asset, sort of the assets I showed you during the custom scoring bit, that was an added difficulty. So here you can see the very simple rendition of the, of the theme, that this is basically how this motif looks like. I mean, it looks nothing on, on the page, but it was actually surprisingly flexible. It could score a whole bunch of different scenes. So this is uh, the first time the theme is introduced. Uh, Johnny is basically once again going to kick Arasaka's ass. We also used it in an emotional context when Johnny is talking to Alt. And it was also part of our combat cues. Now, we had to drop it from A, because A was the key that most of our score was, was written in. And we had to drop it to D to really make use of that drop D tunic that refused its playing in. And so the whole riff and the whole motif is now in D. And it became a part of the, one of the samurai songs, the ballad. And I'm gonna play you a fragment that's actually the very beginning of the track. And also there's a development section when the, the, the riff in the way I just played you is actually countered with, again, the same riff, but played in a slightly different rhythm. So it wasn't the only theme that we actually used in our score. Other Johnny Silverhand songs like Chipping In or Never Fade Away were also 
modulated and reimagined as uh, cues in our score. For instance, this is chipping in. And this is a rave version of chipping in. And also never fade away got a similar treatment. It, this is, was used in this way as the ending cue in a lot of the Corpo quest or the epilogue quest for Johnny. Radio playlists are a big part of source music too. They play primarily in cars and other vehicles, as well as in number of clubs, but also everywhere else where we felt adding some extra musical layer would improve the scene or the location. The main idea behind them was to come up with a variety of genres citizens, citizens of Night City would listen to. It's a tiny but still important role music has to uh, contribute into the world building process. Teenagers, after all, would listen to different music than male strummers, uh, hence the uh, presence of pop. Jazz in 2077 is considered as new classical music and it's listened to uh, the cultural elite, uh, snobs, corpos and other people. So how do you populate 11 playlists with enough songs? We've commissioned over 150 original or unreleased tracks, plus we've licensed several jazz pieces recorded in 1970s by Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, Chad Baker and other jazz icons. Why not going with licensed song in general though, for the whole thing? First of all, our game director, Adam Badowski, didn't want to create any unnecessary connections between the real world, our world, and the reality of Cyberpunk 2077. To a degree, he once said to me, it wouldn't make sense to listen to The Prodigy in 2077. They would be so old, after all. Second reason is, the license eventually expires, which forces the developers to issue an update to the game, which removes expired tracks. We really wanted to make sure playing our game even a few years after the release will deliver the same experience and the music will remain unchanged. We've invited dozens of artists to contribute to the soundtrack. And to make sure we do not break the immersion of having 2020s artists existing in dystopian futuristic world, everyone get their own alter ego. Lots of bands appear in quests, not only Samurai, but also Kerry Eurodyne, Askrax, pictured here with V and Kerry, Lizzy Weezy and others. Uh, we took great care to make sure every quest a particular band or artist may be a part of is suited with the fitting tracks by this artist, not only from the world-building perspective, but also from a musical point of view. Retrospective part of Johnny Silverhand's past as a rock legend slash terrorist Kerry's storyline about his beef with Askrax are just a few examples of that approach. Of course, since, since it's an RPG game, we can differently interact with all these musicians with results, which results in different outcomes. So, for example, Kerry finds out there is this band that stole his song. He wants V to take care of the problem. It's up to player, though, to decide how this should be played out. In the result, it may happen V manages to end the beef between Kerry and Astrax and have them work together on a new track together, the track we obviously would produce. Okay, so what we've learned throughout the process of scoring Cyberpunk. So first of all, repetition, repetition, repetition. 
in order for teams to work and for players to be able to identify which motif belongs to which car, you have to basically repeat them a lot, but you can't do that haphazardly. You can't put V's theme in every single combat queue. You have to pick your spots and then go with it. Also, spotting was key and identifying the needs of the game. In order to you know, try to create the illusion of having a very linear story, we basically had to custom score and implement everything. So identifying what you need and what the player is going to hear from scene to scene was absolutely essential. Also, performance and interpretation. In order to, for the music to come off the page and actually create an emotional response, you have to either take your time or give the right instructions to the players. And it doesn't matter whether you're using instruments or synthesizers, performance and interpretation of the material is absolutely key. Also, context creates emotions. You know, don't try to put a hat on a hat. Sometimes you just have to let the already established relationships between the characters kind of speak for themselves. And not every scene needs a terribly emotional music. Sometimes you just want these things to be gently pushed along. On a more production-related side, in-house music theme is a pretty cool thing to have. We can make a lot of music, a lot of assets quickly, implement them, and kind of take ownership of our work. And it doesn't matter if it's score or custom source music. It's a good thing to have. Also, we still suck at systems and generative music, but we try to make up for it by producing a lot of bespoke assets. And we think we're getting better at it. One more thing to add is that features like the dynamic 2D, 3D, 3D switch or other things that we talked about shouldn't be gimmicks. I mean, they should be used just in the right spot to be as effective as possible. And on a final note, be bold. And don't be afraid of using music. You know, don't mix your music too, too, too low. It can be a great asset. It can enhance the immersion and essentially, and hopefully, make the game better. So this is our presentation. Thank you for being with us. We hope you've enjoyed it. And hopefully, see you next year. And if you want to message us, you can reach us out on our social media.